After returning from the remote west coast of Tasmania, where we had no cell phone reception, and discovering the widespread disruption due to the coronavirus pandemic, we decided to stay on the east coast of Tasmania to remain in regular contact with our families. Where's it look? Keep everyone at arm's length. Full isolation measures were in place, but you can join us this week to see why that had little effect on our day-to-day -day life. Welcome to Free Range Sailing. Join us as we sail around Australia, visiting its wild places in our 30-foot, 50-year-old sailing boat, Marul. Living off the land and sea while sailing a yacht that costs less than a new car, we show that it's possible to have big adventures with a seaworthy boat on a very modest budget. Never miss an episode of Free Range Sailing again. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button to stay notified of all our upcoming releases. Smoked mullet perfection. Last night we went looking for flounder, so we apparently you catch them here with a flashlight and a spear. We didn't find any flounder, but we did manage to spear a big mullet. And we, a we, found, we found some flounder, but that was small. That's right. We saw a little tiny flounder, but we weren't going to spear them. But we did see this big mullet, so we speared him, and I've been smoking him on the barbecue this morning. We've got a very light southerly breeze at the moment, and we're close hauled sailing. Going to go check out the Recherche Bay area. There's a few different anchorages and some walks, and I think we're going to be boat bound for a little while as well with some rain. But it's a beautiful day right now, so we're enjoying the sail. So we came back from the little west coast jaunt and we came back and things got a little bit crazy, coronavirus wise. Um, so it's definitely nice to be back in communications with, um, with our families. We had been thinking about going up to Strawn, the Tassie people following, wondering if we're going to go to Strawn. But um, we got some weather to come back. And now things were just got a bit crazy than what even we expected. We thought they were going to get a bit crazy. So we're just going to hang around um, where we might have access to communications for a bit longer. Mm. Just, we've got families, you know? <laughs> so, what a crazy time. Bit of controlled burning, reminiscent of our time in New South Wales. Maybe these Nordleys that we're expecting over the next day or two might make things a bit smoky for us. <laughs> we might not catch any rain. So people were telling us, oh, you're going to love the west coast of Tassie, no one there. Well, we're on the east coast and <laughs> we're seeing we're seeing less people than we did over on the west coast. Admittedly, over on the west coast we saw like uh, fishing boats. We saw you know, a few private yachts and things like that. But over here, I mean, we've seen Two, well, we pulled into Dover, so we saw some boats in there, but we've only seen like two three or three yachts sailing yachts. In Bru at Bruni over three days. Yeah, and, and the rest have just been like salmon farm boats whizzing around the place. So you can definitely come down to Tassie and find a, find a little pocket all to yourself. And you can, um, we also heard that it was going to be a little bit more difficult getting some abalone or, you know, like a fish or something like that as we went further south. But I, I think things are pretty well managed here in Tassie and I'm pretty sure you could come down and you could find yourself a, a nice little spot out in the open and you could probably get yourself a feed as well. What you do have to be careful of though is that the, the weather can just change in an instant and it won't necessarily be all that predictable either. We were expecting a, um, a bit of a, a reach down in here and being close hauled the whole way. Luckily it's only 8 or 10 knots and we're all likes that sort of thing, but 
Not everything is guaranteed here. <laughs> Safely anchored, we decided to take the dinghy out to the mouth of the bay to go for a dive for some food, as our fridge stocks were getting low. On our way to the dive spot, we saw this sea lion performing some aqua yoga, and we jumped in to get a closer look at her from the water. There are plenty of abalone to choose from in these waters, so finding a feed of legal sized black lip abalone is easy work. It is also very common to find the abalone in clusters of three like this, and we'll often choose the biggest and leave the smaller ones behind. A really peaceful morning here in Reshesh Bay. There's not a breath of wind. The sea is all glassed out. And there's a lot of people about. It looks like people are all with this COVID-19 virus, with the coronavirus, everyone's out self-isolating on their yachts, which is really nice to see. There's um, people are being still being social, but keeping their distance. They're rowing in their dinghies and visiting people and saying good day. And People doing maintenance out on the deck. It's really lovely. I'm just looking at Troy now. He's up on the bow. He's doing something with our head sail. So let's go and see what he's up to. What am I up to? On our, um, on our head sail furler, how it all works is you have these various sleeves with really cool bearings in them. All right, and this one, so the halyard attaches to that. The line that pulls the sail up, gives it tension. This one obviously is holding the top of the sail. Um, and there's a bottom, there's another sleeve down here on a bearing, exactly the same as these, that holds the bottom of the sail. And what that means is like you can pull it up and it's everything's free to move. Really, really great system. Um, so we met a rigger that works with the refit guys in Hobart and he gave us these soft shackles that he made up. And he, he was just saying just to replace the metal shackles because these are stainless steel shackles. And he was saying, Replace it with a soft shackle and you'll have no dissimilar metal problems. Um, I was looking at it now, and because it's been so many years I've been using this furler with these shackles in there, the shackles, by pulling up like that and, and working, they've actually made quite sharp edges in there. So I figured I might just leave it all alone um, until I can get a nice, smooth rat tail file and maybe just chamfer those edges again I don't want to I don't want to put this because for all its uh, for all its strengths Dyneem is just not going to handle <laughs> being on a being on a sharp edge so I'll stick with the shackles for now now's a good time to renew the mousing and when I say mousing when you do up a shackle of course it's a screw it can undo um, if it rattles and stuff like that so just by putting a, a little thin zip tie on there this one this one I'll mouse those because they go up there and they don't get very much attention. The bottom shackle, I never mouse it because I pretty much look at it, or Pasky looks at it, whenever we pull the anchor. So we're always inspecting that one so it doesn't need any mousing. But anyway, 
it's just a good opportunity to just inspect our kit. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when did I put this? This furl has been going for five years without a break. So, and I've inspected it probably about ten times, <laughs> <laughs> twice a year. But because it's up the top there, you know, it doesn't get much salt water. Um, gets whenever we have a rain, it gets a good wash. Those bearings certainly don't seem like they're in any trouble at all. So it's all going well. You might as well just hoist it back up and I'll, I'll put these soft shackles away when we do our refit. The knot I use on my halyard, <clears throat> everyone sort of has their own little favourite knot, but I just like to use an anchor hitch. And that's, uh, people have been trusting their anchors to it for a long time. They can trust my halyard. And the benefit of it is, is when you have the finished knot drawn up nice and tight, the knot is around the shackle, so it doesn't, it, it does, it's not a loop, you know, it doesn't take up any extra height. And of course, it can be undone later on, like uh, if you ever want sail work done or anything like that. So an anchor hitch is essentially just like a round turn when you start that. So it's just looping around there like this. Just goes in front, okay, not behind. Just goes in front and then through those loops. We'll give it a reasonable sort of tail and dress it down like you would any knot. The dressing is the is the secret. And the more you pull on it, the more it jams this tail. Mm -hmm. So I particularly like that hitch for, for halyards. There's other knots that you can use, um, but a lot of them will jam up quite heavily and you'll be you'll be cutting the line later on. But that one's a beauty. And like I said, that's We've been using this for a long, long time through lots of conditions and I haven't seen one of these fail yet. So they're a pretty well respected knot. Well, hitch, not a knot. So I'll just keep using it. We'd also noticed that our head sail had chafed where it enters the furler channel on the fourth day. So we used this opportunity to mend it with some sail tape. It's not very neat, but... <laughs> I'm going to sew that. Troy's going to sew it. Well, this is, uh, this is by no means going to be a perfect job. But you know what? On a sailing boat, if you decide to get into sailing, and cruising, there's so many things aboard that you have to sort of master to some degree that you're not going to be able to be perfect in all of them. <laughs> but you do need to have some sort of working understanding and a lot of people are very reluctant to try something unless they've sort of, you know, unless they can perfect it. You don't have that luxury on a sailing boat. You just sort of got to have a go at it. But it does sort of, it's, um, I can definitely recommend having a working knowledge of a broad list of different things. I guess at the moment there's quite a few people out there um, now that you know, quite a few people have to be isolated and they're starting to fall back on their own resources and I know it's a little bit hard but I'm hoping that some people actually find a bit of joy in it and maybe a bit of inner strength and satisfaction that they're able to handle these tough times and able to fall back on their and their family's resources. Maybe, uh, maybe a few of us can get back in touch with what's been lost over the years with all this um, you know, like high degree of specialisation in our society and things like that. But anyway, these are just idle thoughts as a fella stitches up his sail. There we go. So, not amazingly pretty, but it should be fairly strong. So I'm no master of sewing, but what I did want to do is make sure that the holes were reasonably distant apart and I just mirrored what the sail maker had done there. Um, and that's just not to weaken it. And then I've just rolled the stitches back so that any one of these stitches, if they do um, chafe or whatever, the other ones won't be in too much of a hurry to come undone. No, it's not the prettiest. Yes, people could probably definitely do a better job. Um, but it'll hold and it'll stop this chafe from continuing. So there's our stitching time.
Part of our situation at the moment is mosquitoes, and the best way that we like to deal with them when we're not putting up screens is the old mozzie coils. Now this is pretty common knowledge I'm sure, but there might be just one person out there that I can help with this bit of info. These mozzie coils, when you're trying to get them apart, <laughs> what you want to do is not try and work from the outside. Separate the middle, the little yin and yang bit right there, and then they just pull apart. <laughs> One of my friends used to be plagued by trying to get them apart until I showed her that. So <laughs> Her mind was blown. Her mind was blown. So <laughs> hopefully, just if one person out there in YouTube land has suddenly discovered something new, how to get mozzie coils apart, it's that simple. <laughs> Craziness. A favourable weather forecast meant we could scoot over to Cloudy Bay on the southern end of South Bruny Island. Here we went for a walk out to East Cloudy Head. On our way, we ran into this unusual creature. That was an albino wallaby, and they are they're pretty rare. I mean, they hang out around here in South Bruny Island. There's a few of them. We cool to see one. Oh, it's coming towards us. Got no way. It is estimated that there are around 200 of these wallabies found only on Bruni Island. Pretty nesty I've walked this one. We've been rubbing shoulders with the bush for about five or ten minutes now. Haven't seen any wombats yet. It's the albino wallaby. Looking forward to the view. Quite nice. Can you see Maru? I can see the path. I see a cray boat. No wind. And rain this morning. Time to set up the rain catcher. And it's supposed to be raining all day. Pretty light, but we might be able to gather a few litres. Fog over mountains. Very tazzy scene. All right, well, it's a wet and rainy day outside and we have abalone to cook <laughs> once again. <laughs> so just for a little bit of variety, um, because we've tried every other different method, we're going to make some fritters today. Is that, is that right? Fritters? Yeah. Pasky's here editing. And I'm cutting. I'm going to... She's cutting, I'm chopping. <laughs> so some of you um, will have been enjoying a bit of time at home I guess and maybe you might be feeling a bit cooped up and cramped let's see if this makes you feeling better this is the size of our space I can touch this window <laughs> and this window at the same time some people uh, often say um, yeah your boat looks really small is it just the camera angle nope it is a small boat <laughs> all right and because it's a small boat we like to keep things as efficient as possible so we're going to chop up the abalone, but something that we really, really like to keep our energy use low is one of these things, a little hand chopping machine. So we're going to be using that, get the abalone, I'll, I'll need to pre-cut it a little bit, um, and then once that's all together, then we'll hand over to Pasky and she can mix up all the ingredients to make it taste really good, and we'll put it all together and see what we come up with. So basically we've got the slicing going on. Here's our little food processor. Because it's such a small little unit, I can only throw, say, a quarter of the abalone in at any given time. Oh, it's upside down. Take him on. 
try and be gentle with it for the first couple of times. I just keep giving it a pull until it becomes easy. We've really appreciated having this little thing because at the moment we're on a real power budget. Uploading, like editing the videos, um, obviously that uses a lot of power and we haven't had hardly any sunshine at the moment. And what will happen is the wind generator will be ticking along but then a very strong gust will come and it'll shut itself down to protect itself from overspeed. And part of its, um, part of it, that function is to have a delay so it's not constantly turning off, coming on, turning off, coming on. So it'll give itself like 15 minutes, 20 minutes of downtime and then it'll sample the wind again and run. But what will happen is you have a really strong bullet, it'll spin like crazy and it'll shut itself down, but then it'll go back to a good wind for generating power, but we're not getting any of it. And also we're not getting any sunshine. So Pasky's editing like mad to get a video up. We had to spend the last 18 hours with the computer on trying to upload a video because we're in a poor reception area. So anything we can do to save power is worth doing. Before I met Pascal, I'd never really known about spatulas, and now my life has changed. These things can get food out of every single nook and cranny. All you bachelors out there, <laughs> bachelors, you need a spatula, because you're going to have a hard time finding a Pascal, let me tell you. <laughs> you know that old story about whether the princess has to kiss a whole bunch of toads before she finds her prince? Well, the same applies for us fellas, doesn't it? So Troy's done a great thing and done all the hard work for me. He's chopped and processed all the abalone and now I'm going to put it all together and cook it into fritters. So that's a little bit of extra chilli in there and Troy's already chopped up the garlic and the onion. And I just diced up some ginger too. Putting the ginger in now. Put all the onion and garlic and chilli in. Use a spatula to get the... <laughs> the bits out. You don't know about spatulas yet, if you weren't paying attention before. And then uh, abalone meat. Next I'm going to add two tablespoons of flour, roughly. We found that if we don't put flour in then the patties don't bind together very well in the fry pan and they fall apart. And then two eggs. eggshell in the bowl but I've managed to pull it out. Now I'm just going to mix all of that together and we'll see what comes out. Oh I might put a little bit of salt in too. Two taste two pinches, big good pinches. You will notice that some there's some big chunks in there of abalone and that's okay because we like that texture. You want it sometimes you can bite into it and have Quite a good chunk of abalone in there. It's pretty good. So yeah, I'm just gonna combine everything and then we'll we'll get frying. Then we're gonna use our ghee. Ta-da! We're halfway through our ghee. We've been away from Hobart for about four weeks now, so yep, we're making <laughs> making a good dent into it. But we love frying all our fish in ghee, it's just, it's the best thing to fry and it has a really high smoke point so you can get it really hot in your fry pan and the oil's not going to burn. Once the ghee starts to smoke, slightly reduce the heat on your fry pan and spread the fritter batter evenly over the fry pan. Fry the fritters for 5 minutes on each side or until golden brown. To serve, we placed the fritter on a plate and topped it with our homemade kimchi, Japanese mayonnaise, chopped scallions and toasted sesame seeds. This is the kimchi that I made like five weeks ago in Hobart and it's doing really well. It's actually nicer now than what it was a couple of weeks ago. It's been fermenting really nicely. You ready to tuck in, Troy? This is an amazing presentation. Thank you. So you got the good one. As I deserve. Do you think the kimchi goes well with it? I think the kimchi goes really great with it. Yep. When you when you have kimchi on some of the patty, 
yeah. some of the flavour of the abalone struggles to come through. Yeah. But it's still delicious, right? Mm -hmm. and the texture's really great. But when you just have a bit of patty by itself. Mm -hmm. Or a bit of kimchi by itself. <laughs> Kimchi's pretty strong flavour though, isn't it? Mm. I can't believe how well it's lasted given how much we like it. Mm. There's a lot to be said for making five kilos of kimchi. <laughs> so it's a big thumbs up from both of us. We like abalone fritters. It adds, um, it adds variety. It does, it adds variety. We've been doing them in mm. panko, slicing them thinly and cooking them in butter. But Patty's is the latest addition and we really like it. So Let's I'm going to tuck in. Thanks for watching the video this week and if you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit that like button. We look forward to seeing you next week. Bye for now.